First, Second Timothy was written to a man, Titus written to a man. Here's the book of Philemon written to one man, and it's written to one man to address one situation in that man's life. It's interesting how specific a, uh, a matter this is, and yet, although it was written to one man 2,000 years ago about a specific situation in his life, uh, of which that specific situation you and I will probably never encounter uh, the very same thing, the book has such depth and has such uh, wealth of application to our lives, it's, it's incredible. Here's a man named Philemon who lived in the city of Colossae, who was apparently a man of some kind of wealth. He, he had uh, a number of slaves, at least one of whom, his name was Onesimus. And uh, that's why Paul is writing this letter. He's writing this letter on behalf of uh, Philemon's runaway slave, Onesimus. Uh, so here's a letter about and on behalf of a runaway slave being written to that runaway slave's master. And ironically, that runaway slave Onesimus, along with his travel companion Tychicus, are going to carry that letter to Colossae and deliver it to Philemon. Paul spends the first, uh, first several verses, really about the first seven verses of this, uh, of this letter, um, addressing Philemon, talking to him ab about uh, the kind of man that he is, the influence that he has had uh, in the church in, uh, in Colossae. We'll look at that in just a minute. And then, what's the first word you have in verse 8? Therefore. When you get to verse 8, that's where Paul starts to get into the meat of, his, of the purpose of his letter. You have those first seven verses as introduction. You have those first seven verses to address Philemon. And, and really, I see those first seven verses as building Philemon up. Not, not in some arrogant, uh, puffed up way, but to build Philemon up for who he was in that church. Uh, we learn in, in, verse, uh, in verse 2 that it's likely that the church in Colossae was meeting in his home. Uh, they, they didn't have church buildings. They met in homes. And uh, that he, he was a very hospitable man, a very godly man, um, a man who had the church meeting in his home. And uh, Paul says that he was thankful to God for him in verse 4, that he always prayed for him. Because, verse 5, he was always continually hearing about Philemon's love, about his faith, that he had not only toward Jesus, but he also had love and faith for the saints, for the Christians. Uh, and we talked la the last time that you can't have one or the other. If you're going to have love and faith for the Lord, you've got to have love and faith in the saints. And he talks about the fact in verse 6 that uh, his faith, Philemon's faith, uh, had been shared and that it was spreading. And that Philemon needed to know every good thing that had been accomplished because of his good work. Verse 7, he says, For we have great joy and consolation in your love, Philemon, because the hearts of the saints... Two verses here talk about saints. He has love and faith toward the saints in verse 5. And now Paul tells him in verse 7, The hearts of the saints have been refreshed by you. What a compliment. You know, it, do you know anybody that you could say, you know, the hearts of the Christians have been refreshed by this person? Does anybody have a different word than the word refreshed in your translation? I don't remember if there were any other variations on translation there. The end of verse 7, that the hearts of the saints had been refreshed. What kind of man was Philemon? He's got to be a kind, generous man. In fact, his name, and it's interesting that Paul seems to make a play on the meaning of, of individuals' names in this book. Uh, Philemon's name means affectionate. His name means one who is kind. You see that in the first seven verses. 
You see that he's a hospitable man. The church is meeting in his home. He has love and faith for God, for Jesus, love and faith for the saints, that his faith is being spread and influencing uh, those that, are, that he doesn't even know about in verse 6. And then in verse 7, Philemon, I thank God that Christians are being refreshed by you. What, a, what an incredible man. Paul's not building him up uh, in some vain, empty way. It's an honest and sincere uh, way to do it. But here in verse 8, therefore, he gets to his point. He, think about the fact, could, could Paul have just said in the very first sentence, here's what I want you to do. Here's why I'm writing this. Could he, could he have said it outright in sentence number one? Yeah. By inspiration, Holy Spirit could have done that. Holy Spirit could, Holy Spirit could have written this letter in one sentence. Dear Philemon, accept Onesimus as your brother. Sincerely, the Holy Spirit. He, he could have written it in one single sentence, and that's the whole point of the letter. But you have seven verses that say, Philemon, you're a godly man. Based upon who you are, Philemon, your name means affectionate, your name means one who is kind, here is the request of God toward you. Now, Philemon, here's the kind of man that you are. Now, here's the request. Would you deny this request based upon the kind of man that you are? Talked about in those first seven verses. Verse 8, therefore, though I might be very bold in Christ. We made a big deal two weeks ago about the fact that Paul never calls himself an apostle in this book. You read Paul's other letters. Most of Paul's other letters began, uh, begin in the very first verse saying, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. You, you, you see it in most of his letters right from the very beginning. Paul, he is an apostle. Well, what does that mean? He's one who has been sent by the authority of Christ to carry the, the authoritative message of Christ to the lost and dying world. The apostle was one who was sent with authority. But Paul didn't, Paul didn't call himself that in this book. He never claimed to be an apostle in this book. Uh, in some books that he wrote, he spent a good deal of time defending his apostleship. But he never says it one time in this book. He says here in verse 8, he doesn't use the word apostle, but he says, I could, I could with authority tell you to do something. I could, he says, I might could be very bold in Christ. And I could just command you to do this. Is that true? Could the Holy Spirit have just written to Philemon and say, do this and be done? Yes. Paul says, I'm not writing to you, I'm not writing to you as an apostle. I want you to think about, was, was Paul an apostle? Yes. But somehow he laid aside that, that authoritative role of commanding him. And he says, I'm not writing to you with the apostle hat on. I'm writing to you with your brother in Christ hat on. And he says, rather than write to you and command you to do this, which he said that would be fitting. He said in verse 9, yet for love's sake. I want you to see how many times he says love here. Verse 5, he says, we've heard of your love for the Lord and the saints. Verse 7, he says, we have great joy and consolation in your love. And then he mentions it again. The request that Paul is about ready to make. Now notice he hasn't made the request yet. The request he is about ready to make of Philemon is not based upon, I command you to do this. It's based upon love. It's based upon Paul's love for Philemon. It's based upon Philemon's love for the Lord and Philemon's love for the saints Paul wants Philemon to know how much, not, not how much Paul realizes how much love Philemon has, but how much the Holy Spirit knows. This is based upon for love's sake, he says in verse 9. I'm not commanding you, but I'm rather doing what in verse 9? For love's sake, I rather do, I rather what? I am appealing to you. Anybody got a different word? Beseeching you. Anybody got a different word? The word means begging. I'm begging you. 
I, I'm, not, I'm not telling you, how, I, I'm just coming to you as a friend. I'm coming to you as a brother. And I'm coming to you for love's sake. And I am appealing to you. I am begging you basically to say, Philemon, you need to do the right thing. We're going to get into the specifics, Philemon, but Philemon, you just need to do the right thing here. I'm begging you to do the right thing. Being such a one, verse 9, being such a one uh, as Paul the aged, I, I find that interesting. Is, is Paul pulling out the, uh, just do this for an old man, would you? Is he pulling that card out? You ever had anybody pull that card out on you? You know, would you just do this for me? Just, just do something nice for me I'm, uh, as the old man. Maybe you pulled that card on somebody. Um, maybe you've pulled out your uh, senior citizen, you know, card on it. Paul, what? Under inspiration, Paul says, I'm writing to you as Paul the aged. Now, in our, <laughs> I guess this depends on how old you are, doesn't it? In our world, Paul is not really the aged at this point in his life. Uh, we don't know the exact age of Paul, but at, at this stage, he would have been around his early 60s. Now, for some of you, you say, man, that's ancient. Uh, that's not really that old. <laughs> and he's calling himself Paul the Aged. Now, have you known some 60-year-olds who were really old? Have you known some 60-year-olds that they weren't so old. You think Paul, you th was there anything that ever happened to Paul that might age him a little quicker than the average dude? Yeah. Paul says, I'm writing to you as Paul the aged, but not just Paul the aged, but he says at the end of verse 9, also as the prisoner of Jesus Christ. I want you to remember, Philemon, this isn't coming from... This isn't coming from a stranger. This isn't coming from uh, some young whippersnapper who's got some brilliant idea for you. This isn't coming from somebody who's just running around and, you know, he's just going to, he's just going to, uh, he gets a great idea in his head and he's going to throw an email out to somebody and they just need to do it. And, and because they've got this great, I'm writing to you as Paul the aged. I'm writing to you as a prisoner of Christ. Here's what I'm writing to you, verse 10. I am begging you, I am appealing to you, and here's the first time he mentions, I'm appealing to you for my son, Onesimus. Now put yourself in Philemon's place. You have just received a letter, a personal letter from the Apostle Paul. Would that have made your day? When you check your mail... Do you check the return address to see who it's from? See how quickly you want to open it? When, when, when it's got the, uh, the bank or the uh, mortgage company or the insurance company or the, uh, the whatever company up there, do you just rip in, oh, i got to see what this has got to say? Is that where you are? Uh, we'll put that over. We'll, we'll deal with that another day. But if you get a handwritten letter, not, not something printed out on a, on a label, you get a handwritten card, Handwritten envelope and a handwritten return address. Is that one that you want to open up and read? I mean, unless it's from your bitter enemy or something and you're afraid there might be powder or something inside. For the most part, you want to see. I just got a letter from the Apostle Paul. I want to see what it says. The first seven verses, boy, he's telling me all this good stuff about me. I, yeah, I, boy, Paul, you, you're embarrassing me, Paul. You're saying all this nice stuff about me. And then you get to verse 10 and you read, Onesimus. That's what this is about. That sorry, good for nothing, runaway slave Onesimus, who most likely, when we get to these later verses, we are going to get there, 20 minutes, and, and most likely had stolen from Philemon before he ever ran away from Colossae. So this no good, runaway, thief of a slave, and he's reading a letter from Paul and he gets down to that name Onesimus. I, I, I don't know what Philemon's reaction is. What would your reaction be? Are you kidding me? I just got a letter from Paul and I got to read about Onesimus? Now, 
if Onesimus did his job, he may have chickened out and told Tychicus, you know, you, you go give that letter to Philemon. Tell me, tell me how he responds after he reads it, and then I'll, then I'll see if I'm going home or not. Uh, maybe, or maybe Onesimus delivered that letter to Philemon. I am appealing to you. Now, what does he call Onesimus here in verse 10? My son. What does that mean? My son, Onesimus, whom I have begotten. What does that indicate about the relationship between Paul and Onesimus? When Paul uses that terminology in his other letters, this is talking about uh, the fact that Paul was the one who was instrumental in the conversion of Onesimus to Christ. That Onesimus, although he was brought up in a house of a Christian named Philemon, no doubt he had been taught the gospel, he had at least heard the gospel, Perhaps Philemon had carried his whole family, including his slaves, to worship services on the, on the Lord's Day. And, and all of that is obviously assumption. But uh, if, if you're having worship in your house, you think your slaves were a part of that worship? You know, maybe it's not too great a, a leap to get to that far. But it's when Onesimus goes to Rome and meets Paul that he has taught the gospel. And this terminology in verse 10 is that he has begotten Paul says, I have begotten him. And that's just terminology. And if we had time, we'd go and look at other places where Paul uses that terminology. Not because it was anything Paul did, personally. Uh, when, it, when he uses that terminology in 1 Corinthians 4, 15, he says, I have begotten you through the gospel. It's the gospel that converted and saved Onesimus. Paul was merely the instrument by which that happened. And so when he's writing to Philemon about Onesimus, the first thing he calls him is, he's my son. Now, that, 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 that in and of itself had to start making Philemon's wheels start turning. Because that's not how Philemon saw Onesimus. He didn't see him as Paul's son, Paul's convert, a Christian. Didn't see him as his fellow Christian. That, that was never the picture that Philemon had of Onesimus. So right there, guess what Philemon had to start doing? Oh, I, I, got, I got to see this man in a different light. Have there been people that you know that you had to change how you looked at them? You had to put them and see them in a different light than they were before. But a different light, here's somebody who's not a Christian, now they become a Christian. And I, I have to put them and to see them in a different light because now they are a child of God just like I am. Have you ever seen a Christian who wandered away, maybe spent months, years away from the Lord, and then they came back to serve the Lord? I've got to put that person in a different picture. Philemon reads... He's my son, Onesimus, whom I have begotten while in my chains. Remember where I am. He mentions these chains several times in this book. While I've been, you remember I'm a prisoner uh, in, in Rome who once, and here's where he, 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 he makes another play on words here in verse 11. Who once, Philemon, you remember that Onesimus was once unprofitable to you. He, sorry, old slave. Oh, Ruth. Go ahead. Yes. He, he could have, uh, Ruth said, didn't Paul send the letter by Onesimus? And yes, he did. Uh, he, he could have been there when he opened it. it there were two couriers uh, that we know of, uh, Tychicus and Onesimus, who both traveled. Um, and this, we know this from uh, the book of Ephesians, book of Colossians. They carried three letters. Those two men, Tychicus and uh, Onesimus, and, and perhaps even others, carried the, the letters of Ephesians, Colossians, and Philemon and delivered those letters. Uh, obviously, Colossians and Philemon went to the same city. Um, so with two men delivering, we, we, uh, would Philemon have been there to deliver it? Would he have asked Tychicus to deliver it? Uh, would he have had a tummy ache that morning when uh, it was time to deliver that letter? Um, you know, it, Philemon or Onesimus... Uh, we have every right to believe could have been there while he was reading it, which wouldn't that, wouldn't that drive you crazy if you were, if you were Onesimus? You just delivered a, a letter to your master, and now you sit there <laughs> while he reads it. 
That'd be like going to the principal's office and he's reading the teacher's note to him about you. You're sitting in the principal. What did the teacher say? The teacher didn't tell him everything, did he? Do you think the teacher maybe left? Oh, I hope the teacher did. If, if Onesimus is sitting there, what did Paul say about me? Boy, I hope he left some of that stuff out. That, that'd be kind of unnerving, wouldn't it? Verse 11, he says to Philemon, he he, he, he's not trying to sugarcoat uh, Onesimus' situation. He's not trying to say Onesimus is perfect, he's grand, he, he, he's, he's never done anything wrong. He, he realizes that Onesimus has done wrong here. And so he says, this man Onesimus, he was once unprofitable to you. He was your slave, but when he ran away from you, when he stole from you, and he took off, guess what? Uh, that slave is no longer of any value to Philemon. That slave is no longer of any profit to Philemon. Onesimus, his name means profitable. And so it's an interesting play on words where Paul says, here's a man whose name means profit. It means profitable. And so he says, there was a time when this man whose name means profitable was not profitable to you. He not only did you wrong, he was going against his own name. But, see that word in the middle of verse 11? But now he is. Now, he's not just Onesimus. Now he is profitable. That's what his name means. Now he is living up to his name. Now he is of value. He is of profit to who? Who's he profitable to? Not just you, not just me. He's profitable to both of us. He's useful to both of us. What, ma what made Onesimus go from unprofitable to profitable? Repentance. Repentance. What would you say, Freddie? The gospel. the gospel. The gospel of Christ and his obedience thereto took someone who was absolutely useless... And made him useful. Isn't that what it did for us? The gospel of Christ and our obedience thereto took us, took me, took each one of us who were at one time unprofitable to God, useless to God, and now profitable and useful in the hand of God. So Paul says, he is that to me, he is that to you. And again, think about, think about the, the idea that Philemon's name means affectionate. One who is kind. And I don't know if the intent is there or not, but Paul is saying, Philemon, Onesimus is now living up to his name. His name means profitable. He is now profitable. He's living up to his name. Philemon, your name means affectionate and one who is kind. I wonder if you will live up to your name. Hasn't even made a request yet. Notice there, there, there's no request yet. All he has said so far is, I am appealing to you for my son Onesimus. Appealing, appealing for what? Go to verse, verse 12. I am sending him back. We talked two weeks ago about what that conversation must have been like between Paul and Onesimus. Who brought up this idea? You know, here, here's Onesimus uh, visiting Paul in prison in Rome. Who came up with the idea? You know, maybe Onesimus ought to go back to his master, Philemon and Colossians. You think Onesimus came up with that idea? You think Onesimus was sitting around saying, you know what, Paul? You know, it'd be really grand. You know, it'd be the best thing ever for me to go back, go back and be a slave to Philemon. You see anybody in their right mind saying that? I mean, in, 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 in my imagination, the, the conversation is flipped where Paul brings up the subject. What do you think was Onesimus' reaction if that happened? Excuse me? You, you want me to do what? You want me to go back where? Paul, that's, that's 1,200 miles away. You know, I'm, I'm pretty happy right here. No, I am sending him back. Remember the premise here is, Philemon, you need to do what's right. And so Paul is basically saying, I'm, I'm trying to do what's right. And that's what he says in these, I'm sending him back. 
You therefore receive him. Receive him how at the end of verse 12? I'm sending him. And how was Paul sending him? I am sending him as what? My own heart. I'm not just sending a person back. I'm not just sending to the Romans. To the Romans was Onesimus a person? No. Onesimus is a slave. In the Roman world, if you were a slave, you're not a person. You're a thing. You're an object. You're a possession. Paul takes Onesimus, sends him back, and he says, I am sending him as I would my own heart. Verse 13, I wished to keep him with me. I wished I could have kept him. Remember, he was profitable, both you and me, the end of verse 11. I am sending him back. I'm trying to do what's right. I wanted to keep him, but that wouldn't be right. He, does, he, he, he is your slave. In the Roman world, he, he belongs to you. So I am trying to do what's right, sending him back. I wish I could have kept him uh, because he could have stayed here and ministered unto me uh, in my chains. Remember Onesimus or Philemon? I'm in prison for the gospel. But without your consent, I didn't have your permission. I didn't have your permission to keep your slave. I, I didn't want to do anything then without your consent because I didn't want your good deed to be done by compulsion. I didn't want you to have to let me keep him. I wanted you to do it voluntarily. Paul is saying, Onesimus, I am trying to do what's right. Or Philemon, I'm trying to do what's right, sending him back. Onesimus, he's doing what's right. He's coming back. What then is the third step? Philemon, you need to do what's right. And here it is in verse 15. For, what do you have at the beginning of verse 15? For, what word do you have after that? Perhaps. Perhaps. Anybody have a different word than the word perhaps? Peradventure. What would you say? If possible. Huh? Oh, okay. Sorry. For it is possible. Is this something that Paul knew? It is possible. Do you say that when you know something for certain? No. For perhaps, this could be the case. For perhaps he was parted. It's a passive verb. For perhaps he was parted for a while. For perhaps, Philemon, he was parted for a while, for this purpose. Paul says, I, 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 don't, I don't know. I, I don't know why all of these things have happened. But here is a possible reason this has happened. Why did Onesimus run away? Why did Onesimus go to Rome? How did Onesimus end up in Rome? How did Onesimus travel 1,200 miles west of his home city? How did Onesimus end up in a prison cell, either as a prisoner or not as a prisoner? How did Onesimus end up in the prison home of the Apostle Paul? How did Paul end up teaching the gospel? There's all sorts of how did that happen kinds of questions. There's all sorts of how did or why this or uh, how come that. Paul says, I don't know the answer to all those things. Perhaps. It's the same kind of terminology that we read in other places in the Bible. We read that kind of terminology uh, back in the book of Esther. Where Mordecai said to Esther, For who knows... If you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Esther, how did you become, how did a Jewish girl become queen of a pagan nation of Persia and get in a position where she could save the Jews? Was it because God did that? We, 
Mordecai did, Mordecai did not say it's because God did that. He said, who knows? But what God put you in this position. That's the same terminology that Paul's using here. Perhaps. It's possible. Who knows? But that he was parted from you for how long? The beginning of verse 15. For a while. Whatever that period of time was, from the time he left to the time he got back, Paul says, he was only parted from you for a while, but for what purpose? That you might receive him, and that's the key word in this book is the word receive, that you might receive him for how long? Forever. Contrast in in time. Paul says, perhaps it was the providence of God. Not that God caused him to run away and and to break the law. That's, That's not the way providence of God works. But perhaps it was God's providence that took those circumstances, used them on the behalf of Onesimus and Philemon, so that Onesimus might be taught the gospel in order that he might go back to Philemon. And he was parted for a short period of time, for a while, in order that Philemon might receive him forever. We receive him forever as a slave? No, the next verse he says, not as a slave. So what does he mean to receive him forever then? How do you receive somebody forever, for eternity? As a brother in Christ. That's where he's going. He says, this is not about what's happening on this earth. This is about something much bigger. It's about eternity. So that you might receive him forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave. He's not just coming back there as your slave. He is coming back there as more than a slave. He is coming back there in order that you might receive him as a what? As a brother. Now, that's not all your Bible says. What kind of brother? Did you have a brother who was not so beloved growing up? Is there a difference? But Matthew, did that get your attention? That, that's, that Matthew, that just seemed to get, Matthew all, all of a sudden perked up when we started talking about brothers who weren't so beloved. Um, we'll, ask, uh, we'll, we'll ask Seth and uh, uh, we'll ask their opinion privately. But uh, is there a difference between somebody who's a brother and somebody who is a beloved brother? Onesimus comes back and Paul could have said, we want you, God wants you to receive him as a brother. Mm, okay. All right, I might be able to do that. You know, did you ever grin and bear it with your brother or your sister? Okay, well, you know, uh, he, he won't be here forever. They're going to leave on Friday, so I can deal with this until Friday because uh, he's my brother. No, you receive him as a beloved brother. And you notice back in verse 1, to Philemon, our beloved friend, to the beloved of Phia in verse 2. He's already used that word to describe Philemon. Now he says, That's the word that describes Onesimus. He's a beloved brother, especially to me, but much more to you, both in the flesh, in that uh, that, uh, uh, relationship between a master and a slave, but even more in the Lord. You know, what's interesting is that now Philemon and Onesimus had a master-slave relationship, Now Philemon and Onesimus had a brother-to-brother-in-Christ relationship. Now Philemon and Onesimus, you know what else they shared in common? They were both converts of Christ, or or converts of of Paul to Christ. He's called, Onesimus is called his son in verse 10, and he says down in uh, in verse 18 uh, that Philemon was the same. Look at verse 17, I know we're running out of time. If then, Philemon... If you count me as a partner, if you count me as a friend, if you count me as as one in fellowship with you, here is the first command in this book. The first imperative. The first thing he tells him to do. He's been telling him who he is in God's eyes. He's been telling him about Onesimus and this new relationship that he and Philemon now have together. And then he gets to verse 17 and here's the first thing he tells him to do. First imperative. If you count me as a brother, a friend, a partner in fellowship with you, receive him. 
Receive him into your family, the word means. You receive him into your family circle. And you receive him how? You receive him, give, give me like a minute here if you would. Receive him as you would receive me. In other words, if you don't receive him, you're basically rejecting me. Receive him as you would even receive me. But if he has wronged you, if you read Onesimus' name in verse 10 and this, and you think, man, he stole this and this, and he did me this wrong, and he did me this wrong, Paul says, wipe that out. If he's wronged you, if he can't repay it, if he has done something where he owes you anything, here's the second imperative in this, in this book. Here's the second command. First one, receive him as a brother as you would receive me. Second command, put it on my account. Charge it to me. If he's done you wrong, you charge it to me. You receive him not as a slave, but you receive him as a brother. Let me make this final point. I knew we were going to have a hard time getting through this book. Can you believe that? When Paul says to Philemon, you put that on my account. You charge that to my account. And you receive Onesimus, not as Onesimus, but you receive him as you would receive me. Look at the last verse of this book. And it's a, it's, it's a verse, it's a statement that we, we just read right over because we read it all the time. If you want to read the end of Paul's letters, he says this every single time. I want you to read the last verse of this book. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Was it not the grace of Christ that said to the Father, Receive David as you would receive me. Was it not the grace of Christ who said to the Father, Whatever debt David has, you put it on my charge. That's what Christ did on our behalf, isn't it? You put it on my charge. Receive him, Father, as you would receive me. Paul is saying to Philemon, that's how you need to receive this brother in Christ. This is a book about Christian forgiveness. And it's a book to us about Christian forgiveness. If the Father is going to receive me as His child, as He would receive Jesus, without putting a charge upon me for my wrongs, how should I receive a brother who has done me wrong? Should I not be gracious? Should I not be forgiving? Even when they've done me wrong. It's an incredible little book. It's got a depth that, that we would never be able to reach. Thank you for that minute now being four extra. And uh, we'll see you Sunday morning.